Good afternoon. Um, I'm crazy about backups for some reason. I back up to disk, then I copy it to tape, and then I copy the tapes, and I put the tapes somewhere else, and I have them in a bank vault, and I have them in a friend's basement. So hopefully, if there's ever a disaster, it, I, I can restore. So we're not going to cover in installation, concurrent jobs, lots of other things. This is basically an introduction to how I use Bacula and how you might get clever ideas about how you can use it too. So basically, Bacula is a set of programs. Um, they're independent modules. You can install them on different um, uh, devices. Um, it is client server. So basically, you've got a server that talks to a client, which talks to a storage device, and it just keeps going on from there. Um, People sometimes get shocked that Bacula does not use tar. Don't be upset that it doesn't use tar. Tar is good, but it's not good for everything. Um, this little, oh, sorry, this little bit here. Uh, sorry, where we go? There we are. So copy all your comp files and your SQL files that you dump out somewhere else. Copy it several different places because if you lose your uh, catalog, which we'll get to later, it's horrible, and you have to use bextract. Um, this is an old DEC DLT 7000 tape drive that I use. Uh, that machine uh, died shortly thereafter. It's a DLT 8000. I found the 7000s more reliable than the 8000s. This stores about 80 gig um, compressed. Um, I back up to local disk. Everything streams down to the local ZFS server, um, then gets copied to tape afterwards. Um, I used to copy to tape every day. Now I only copy to tape once a month, mainly because it's summertime. Terminology. The director is the thing that knows everything. It, it's like your global process. It does everything that nobody else wants to do, but it does everything. SD is your storage daemon. Uh, Deer and SD are often referred to as a server together. Those... This is brand new. Sorry. So you want your DIR and your SD always to be on the same version. Never get them out of sync. Your FD can be behind, but never ahead. Um, so here are the steps in running a quick backup. So you get on B console. Uh, it contacts uh, the Bacula director. And you say, hey, listen, I want to run a job. It contacts Bacula FD. And it gets told that you're supposed to back up these files to the storage daemon. It contacts the storage daemon with the files that it's going to back up. The storage daemon puts those files on either the disk or the tape. And then the storage daemon sends uh, to Bacula Dur a list of things that got backed up. That gets stored in the catalog because you, when, you go time, when it's time to restore, you use the catalog to find out where the stuff is. This is a typical setup. You have one director and a bunch of FDs that it talks to. And the key thing here is the director always does the initiation. It contacts the FD and tells it it's time to back up. So the schedule isn't dictated by the clients. It's dictated centrally. There is an option for an FD to do a self-started backup, but I never use it. Um, this is your usual starting point when you're getting started. You have a directory, you have an SD, you have disk and, or tape, and then you have a catalog server. Catalog server is the most important part of your backup. We'll get to that later. Um, th now we're getting a little more advanced here, where you have one directory, you have multiple FDs all contacting it, but you also have another Bacula director that contacts them as well. These can be identically configured so that this FD thinks that that one and that one are identical and they can all connect in. It's just the shared secrets that count when you're connecting through. We'll get into that soon too. So here's, here you're going really crazy. You've got one catalog, a director, another storage daemon over here, a whole bunch of stuff, two different catalogs. This is all very feasible. You can have multiple databases that it writes into. You can have one per client, for example, one per pool. We'll get into pools later. So this is key to keep track of. It's not based on cron. You can run a backup manually. And many configuration options can be set when you are running manually. But when you run automatic, it just uses the defaults. And we'll get into the into defaults. Restores cannot be scheduled, but they can be automated. And by automated, I say, I mean, 
echo run restore equals blah 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 pipe b console. So you can automate it that way. Um, hot tip there. That, that's running a job. You can run that on the client and it pipes it to B console and then it backs up that client. And that yes is just an auto prompt saying, no, I'm not going to prompt you. So that's just an example. So then it'll connect to the director, it'll do that, it'll, there's a job being run, it uses that catalog and it's queued, that's it, the job's run. Might take a few hours, but you started it. These are These are a whole bunch of tools that come with back. Is it sleeping? No, it's not sleeping. This is all in here. The screen's on here. Okay. <laughs> okay. Because this screen keeps flashing as if they, oh, there, it's as if the external screen is going away. I turn this so you can see it. It is. Okay. So let's see here. Where were we? So I can keep talking. You don't need to see all the slides. So B console is your main interface between your fingers and the rest of the system. Uh, it seems a bit primitive to have a, a program that you run in order to access it. So in that regard, it's not a true command line tool, but you can run B console from the command line. So you can do it from the command line. Actually, B console is really great because they actually when they're doing regression testing, B console is what all the commands are fed through. So if anything, B console is one of the best um, tested tools in the suite. So um, it's not important to know the commands. There is a utility that comes with it called B tape. If you're going to use a tape drive, run it through B tape. It makes sure that all the configuration settings that you have are appropriate. It's almost like the external monitor is going away. Touch. All right. So, sometimes in the status you'll see old jobs and stuff like that. The same thing with temp logs. I've seen so many people waste time trying to get rid of these. Just move on. It's important to note that it's not all run as root. The director runs as bacula bacula, storage runs as bacula bacula. Often it's in the operator user group so it can access the tape drives. Bacula FD has to run as root wheel in order to read everything and also to do, be able to restore everything. But you can configure bacula FD so that it is read only and it cannot do writes. Um, yeah, there's the operator group. Um, this is a bit that confuses people all the time. Passwords are shared. That's how you authenticate one daemon to another. So you have the same stored secret in two different locations. You have it in the director director's configuration file, and you have it in the storage daemon's configuration file. So that's how they, how they communicate. They are not encrypted passwords. You just secure the file in which these passwords are located. And people get all uppity about that. But No. No, all communication is done over an encrypted channel. Um, it's a shared secret. So remember this bit, and you'll have a much better life when it comes to setting it up. Um, a lot of the passwords look like they're encrypted because people use random text. But literally, you can just say, this is my password, colon. And that's your password, and you can use that. So you have a bconsole.conf. You say, I want to correct, connect this director, and that's just a name. It's not an address or anything. That's just the identifier used by the um, Bacula direct director at that location, and that's the password that you use. So that same password will occur in the Bacula director's configuration. There it is there. So it listens on a different port. They're all 9101, 9102, 9103. Um, and 
what this is, this defines who you are, but this password is for people connecting to you, not for you connecting somewhere else. So whenever you have a, a, sta a clause that says ref is self-referential, that's the password for contacting you, not for contacting someone else. So everyone struggles with this. Everyone struggles with this the first time through. Even I get stuck with it, but it's a very good FAQ to go with it. When it says the name and password do not match, check and make sure the names and passwords match. It's very, so many people get stuck on this. Get right down to the TCP level. Make sure that you're contacting the right host. Do a TCP dump. Check your DNS. Try accessing, uh, re replace the fully qualified domain name with an IP address. Somewhere something's wrong, and it's not your name and password. Um, well, it could be. But. Okay. Uh, every director and, sorry, every SD and FD needs at least one entry like this, and that identifies um, who they will accept connections from. There can be multiple instances of this for each SD and FD. So basically, I'll talk to anyone or I'll talk to everyone that's listed in my configuration file. A file set, what do I back up? That's a file set. That's the list of files I'm gonna back up. It can be a list of directories. It can be a list of uh, explicit files. It can be auto-generated on, on, at runtime. I have a script that says back up all these file sets and all it does is ZFS list and defines the ones that I wanna back up. I do that for jails. Uh, basically, I, each jail is a separate file system and it may change over time. So when I add a new jail, it automatically gets included in the backup for the jails. Oh, this part is important. One file set per job. Don't try and make a job that backs up multiple file sets, either create new multiple jobs or create one big file set. Um, this is what a client resort looks like. Um, it's a fully qualified domain name, the catalog that you're going to use, um, the password for this client. This is what, um, this will also be, sorry, this is specified in the director. This, for this particular client, the director would contact it with this password supplying its own name. So this is a shared secret, which will also occur in the Bacula client configuration file. Now, when I say client, I say FD, but the client is actually the host it's running on if you really want to get technical. Um, you can think of the Bacula FD as also being a server, but it's, it's, it's a client running on the client, which is a server, because you're backing up a server. So. Um, schedules are just so flexible. This is the one that I use. I say that on the first Sunday of every month, you run a full. Every other Sunday is a differential. All the other days are incremental. Pretty easy. Um, I actually go one step further and I say, uh, it, it's not shown here, but I say all my full backups go into the full pool, all the differential backups go into the differential pool. You can get really, really flexible. Here, here's a job. That's all you have to do to define a job is basically the name of the job, uh, job defs. Basically, all your jobs often have common um, uh, definitions. It's like an include file. So job defs is an include file. Think of it that way. Uh, and there's a file set I'm going to back up. You can use the same file set for multiple clients. So these are the important bits about a job. A job runs on just one client, so on one server. You're backing up one box, you have one job. The job has only one file set. You can't specify multiple file sets. The job backs up to exactly one storage location, but then you can use copy or migrate to move that job to other storage locations. There's just one schedule for the job, but that schedule can say that it, that job runs at different times on different levels on different days. So schedule is not just like a cron tab entry, it's much more flexible. You can have multiple jobs per client, and I do it that way. I have different ZFS data sets. I want them backed up at different times on different uh, media and for different reasons. So 
don't think of don't, don't limit yourself to just one job per client because one job per thing you want to back up. There may, might be multiple things that you want to back up on that client. This is your job desk that I told you about. This is your include. <coughs> Basically, you put all these in a job jobs def include type thing. I actually put my job desk in a separate file and then include that into the Bacula director file. But this is just shorthand, so you don't have to specify the same thing in every job. This is where I start saying things like, okay, when I'm backing up from tape, I want to back up into this pool. And when I'm backing up to disk, I want to back up into this pool. You can put different priorities on jobs so that all of, all of the stuff that's backing up to SSD, for example, runs last because it's going to take less time. You're not worried about it. So you want to run the, the, uh, the hard drives that you're backing up into sooner or whatever priority you want to apply. This bit about spooling data, if you're backing up to tape, you sometimes want to spool the data to a local drive and then back it up to tape. Uh, spooling attributes, generally you want to spool attributes so that at the end of the job it does a whole lot of inserting into the database catalog. That speeds up backups generally. Job level, we sort of covered full incremental and differential before, <coughs> but it's it's important to know the difference between the incremental and the differential. The incremental is relative to whatever last backup ran successfully. And that bit is important. And that's the bit down there that dictates what a successful job is. So differential is just since the last full backup. Incremental is since the last backup, whatever. So generally, uh, in, a, in a month, the worst case you'd be doing to restore at the end would be the full from the beginning of the month, the differential from the last, yes, four Sundays, because you can have five Sundays, and then all the incrementals from later on in the week. Now, this will not give you an accurate restore, because sometimes you delete files, sometimes you add files, but you'll get them all restored, even though they've been deleted from disk. There is a thing called an accurate backup. We'll get to that next. Um, when it's backing up, it looks at uh, C time and M time. So that means that if you copy a whole tree from one location to another, it's not going to get backed up because the M time and C time are the same. That annoys some people. It doesn't annoy me. This is where accurate backup comes in. Basically, what happens is the... Uh, the director sends the FD a list of files that it backed up last time, and the FD compares that to what it finds, and then it ships the files over that aren't in that list. So if you do a move, it'll take note of that and send it over. Of course, it comes at a cost. Um, virtual backups. This is another feature that I've never used, but I've heard really good things about. Every time you run a backup, you have a full backup as a result. And what it does is it jumbles things around uh, logically and says, OK, hey, this is now a full backup. But in effect, you're doing incrementals every day, and it's giving you a full at the end of the day. Um, we talked about priority before. We talked about the schedule. Once you've got all that set up, they all run. For me, it's at 5.55 UTC every day. There's no reason for that time. It's just conveniently in the middle of the night for me. Um, you can also have a schedule that says a job never runs. So basically, you say schedule, whatever, never, close bracket. And that's for jobs that you want to have around that you only run manually, and they never get run, run by uh, Bacula Deer. This is a thing that gets people all the time. If you make a change to your file set, it's effectively a new file set. The file set is actually MD5 well, checksummed into the database. And it says, is this the same as the one I had before? And if not, it does a whole new backup because it is a different file set. But you can get around that by saying ignore file set changes. But then if you make a change, it's not reflected until the next full backup. A volume, think of a volume as a tape and use that for the first little while 
of learning bacula, that a volume is a tape and it's a physical thing and here it is, I've got this tape. Don't confuse it with a file system volume because it also backs up to disk. That's why I say forget about backing up to disk, just think of backing up to tape. So what, it's key to remember that disk and tape are, are sort of treated the same internally. And a backup can span multiple volumes. You have a five gig tape, you have a 20 gig backup, you need four, or maybe only three tapes. But that, that, that's the concept to get in your mind first. So when you're backing up to disk, it creates a file, it backs up into that file, that's a volume. It's not a, it's not a file system volume, it's a backup volume. A pool is a collection of tapes. You've got all your full backup tapes on this shelf, you have all your incremental backup tapes on that shelf, you go and you grab one from the pool. It's important to know that a pool is a set of specifications. This backup will re be retained for three years and every volume that is created based on that pool shares the same characteristics at creation time. You can change them manually later, but that's the bit to keep in your mind when you're using pools. You can have multiple pools. I've got about 10 or 15 different pools, and that's a ridiculous amount given that it's just one person. So a volume belongs to one pool, but it can change pools. Right? Um, after a volume has expired, it can be put back into the scratch pool and then be used by any other pool when it needs a new volume. So these are a lot of common uh, pool attributes. The most important one to remember is volume retention. We'll get to that later and how there's two other retention pe periods as well. Uh, label format isn't so, so complex. It's basically the name you give to the volume. It's the logical volume name. It also happens to be the physical name on disk when you're using disk-based backups. But don't get too complex with, with volume labels. You as an operator don't care about the volume label. It's just something for Bacula to use. You never need to really know what it is, except maybe when you're going to retrieve them from the safe undisclosed location. So here's what, a, what my full file backup looks like. Um, I, I keep everything for three years in that pool. And on disk, it's five, five gig max. Use whatever size you think makes sense. It doesn't make sense to have um, a max size that's way, way more than your usual backup or way, way less than your usual backup. So have it a multiple type thing. If you're doing 100 gig backups all the time, if you have a 20 gig volume file, that's not unreasonable. The key to keep in mind is that when it comes time to recycle a volume, it doesn't get, that three year period doesn't start until the last time it was written to. So you can be using it over several months. Three years doesn't start until the last write, not the first write. So if your older backups are no longer needed, it doesn't matter. They're not gonna disappear until three years after the most recent backup. That's why I tend to keep my volume size less than my total backup size. Diff pool, there's not a lot of difference between the two, just the time period and the names, and the same with the incremental, and you can see the label format as well. So it's all very straightforward. It will not label a volume which is already labeled, such as a tape, okay? So this is, this is the, what you have to go through in order to clear a label off a tape if, if you need to. Uh, storage of resources on disk are, are nothing very special. It's just, it's just here, go and call, contact this host or something running there, uh, back it up there. Uh, the storage resource is very simple. It, it's again a password and, and a fully qualified domain name to go to and then over on the storage daemon, which can be anywhere. It, it can be running on the same host, it can be running uh, on a host on a different VPN, it'll just contact it on the address. Now, on this case, the address on this side, on the storage daemon, means you should only listen on this IP address. You may have multiple IP addresses on this host. Um, 
on the SD, you say only this director can contact me, and they have to supply that password. Otherwise, I'm just going to ignore them. I'm not going to listen to anyone else that doesn't supply that special stuff. So here we're backing up to this directory on disk. It's file. Basically, this just sets it up. It has different meanings on a tape drive, but on a file-based backup, this is sort of what it looks like. This is the most important thing. Your catalog is everything. Protect it even more than your backups because without your catalog, you're not screwed, but you've got a very difficult time to get anything out, okay? Because your catalog defines what was backed up, where it was backed up from, and where it is now. <coughs> um, there are ways of reproducing the catalog based on what's in your volumes but it means reading every single one of your volumes and reproducing the catalog one at a time. And it's a tedious task, and I wish it upon no one. So with a catalog, what can you do with it? You can restore anything from anywhere to anywhere. You don't have to restore to the same server it was backed up from. You can restore it to another. Any client, anywhere just from the comfort of your laptop sitting in the hot tub. So we talked about retention for, before. Retention does not refer to the volume itself on disk or on tape. It refers to the catalog, and keep that in mind. It's how long the information, how long the metadata is retained, not necessarily how long the backup is retained, OK? Because you may wind up not recycling that backup data until much later than that. Because you can still have the backup data, but the metadata about that backup is gone. <coughs> there are three main types of, of retention specifications, file, job, and volume. The file metadata allows you to specify, I want that file from that date restored. The Job metadata allows you to say, I want that job restored from that, from that date. And the volume tells you what's on that volume. So we've covered this already, a little more on retention. So catalogs shrink and grow. If all you're ever doing is, is backing up, backing up, backing up, the catalog keeps getting bigger. But you may have older jobs that are no longer on there. And what you do is you go through a, a pruning process. And you can do that manually or you can do it automatically. I do the pruning automatically. And what it does is it says, is there anything in this catalog that is past its retention date? Yes, there is. OK, get rid of it. And it does it all automatically. Um, but keep in mind, it's only getting rid of stuff in the catalog. You can also purge manually, which removes stuff from the catalog irrespective of retention. You're just saying, delete it. I don't care how long it was supposed to be in there. Just delete it. Whereas pruning follows retention rules. Uh, you can do pruning manually or automatically. I do it automatically. Yeah, we talked briefly about a lost catalog. Don't do that. Um, I, if you lose your catalog, you didn't have a backup, really, of your catalog. You need a backup of your catalog. Um, the extract, you really don't want to do that, but it, it's horrible. It's absolutely horrible. So what I do is every day after my backup jobs, my last job that runs, dumps the catalog uh, to disk, then backs up that catalog into Bacula, and then an rsync job comes along every day and rsyncs that 30 gigabyte file to two or three other locations, along with all the configuration files as well. So do that every day, because one day your backup server is going to disappear, and you're not going. Well, your catalog server is going to disappear, and you're not going to. You're going to have all your backups, but you're not going to be able to do anything with them. So yeah, catalog is your best tool, and seriously, I'm trying to emphasize this so you take care with your catalog. <coughs> And the, the biggest demand I've seen for help is not the passwords, because that's easy. Just go and read this. But when they've lost their catalog, recycling. We, we mentioned that about recycling. You, you have a tape. 
you don't want to keep it forever. After a while, you want to rewrite what is on the tape. Recycling dictates when a tape can be reused. Apply that same logic to the volumes on the disk, and that's what recycling is. But this is the important bit. Bacula will keep filling up your drive regardless of what you think it should be doing. It, it, it has no comprehension of how full your file system is. It'll just keep creating a new volume and writing there. There are directives that you can um, use. Um, you can put pools, you can put restrictions on pools. You can say the maximum number of volume, the max size of this volume. You do the math and that's how much disk space it'll take up. But still, monitor your disk space because one day your jobs are going to fail because they, they didn't, uh, they ran out of space. There's the three types of retention we talked about there. Again, it refers to the catalog, not your backup. This is the way I handle, handle retention. I put job, file, and volume retention all basically at three years because that's the maximum time I'm keeping any backup. But then what I do is as I copy a backup to a different uh, pool, that pool retention overrides it. So any, as soon as one retention period is gone, the data can be removed from the, from the catalog. We covered this already. It's passwords or plain text or just shared, shared secrets. Um, it can use, for the catalog, it can store in SQLite, uh, MySQL, and Postgres. Um, for some odd reason, I recommend only Postgres. Don't use SQLite. It's not big enough. Uh, and MySQL, if, if it fails, I'm sorry for your loss. Uh, disk versus tape, yeah, some people just, you know, tape is really good. I, I, I can easily transport a tape, carry it with me to Europe. No one thinks anything of it. I can leave it at home, whatever. It's easier than transporting a disk, in my opinion. And it's a little more stable, usually. But some people would like to argue with that, but later. There's not a lot of difference. Use tape, use disk, whatever. I just like backing up to tape afterwards. Uh, the disk space issue here is mentioned, but we covered that already. Running a job is pretty straightforward. Uh, this is the type of, uh, of output that you're likely to get. Um, it then gets queued and then runs in the background. You need one job for, per thing that you want to back up, but when restoring, you only need one restore job. Don't bother going and creating a restore job for each client because all of these configuration items in your restore job can be overridden at runtime. And remember, restores are only done manually. So you're going to be doing it manually anyway. Just worry about that later. So when you go to restore job, you get like 13 different, well, 12, a dozen different choices you get here. Uh, the ones that you probably use the most is enter a list of files to restore or uh, select a backup for a client before a specified time. Sometimes it's number five, but you just pick the one you need and go from there. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, we're not gonna do a demo. These slides were originally for a three hour um, lecture, three hour tutorial. Tape drivers, you don't need anything special. It just uses a SCSI file. Um, well, generally it's, it's a SCSI layer. You don't need anything special. There is an MTX changer that deals with MTX directly. You can put any special thing in there you need. Um, yeah, run your B tape tests, especially run a backup that spans two tapes if you're backing up to tapes because sometimes the tape driver doesn't really like spanning tapes. Um, read these two articles, if you, please. Uh, that's where I documented all the fun I had when we first got it going because there is an error in the SCSI uh, driver that we get fixed. Um, use sudo to test the Bacula commands like, sorry, sudo su. Uh, imitate what Bacula is actually going to do. Don't run it by hand. The biggest problem people run into when they're doing tape backups is they haven't tested the process as the Bacula user. They said, but it ran fine when I ran it from the command line. You ran it as root which is not Bacula, it's a different user. Um, we talked about a faucet change. Uh, 
you can have multiple file systems, but you may not want to back up your NFS mount. Um, when it's recycled, it, you can tell it to truncate before running, and this is something obscure about Dragonfly that somebody mentioned to me one day. Spooling, we talked about spooling before. Uh, don't worry. Oh, yeah, sometimes you, not forget that. Backing up jails. In fact, anytime you can, snapshot what you're going to back up. Otherwise, you can have a file that was written at the beginning of the backup, and it gets written at the end of the backup, and it's not consistent. Uh, I put a script on GitHub to do this sort of thing. Um, ignore, you know, don't get very fancy with vo volume labels. Just do something like that because you never have to reference this. Only Bacula has to reference this. Make it do the work. Um, questions. That was a lot of slides in a very short period of time. Oh, wait. We have Olivia. You uh, you are using it uh, to back up files which are stored in, the, in CFS. Uh, oh. Suppose your your yes. system crashes. How do you? Uh, I got a tape. Yeah, that's for the files. But I mean the the general. CFS. Oh oh oh. Uh, one of my servers that I backed up has crashed. How do I restore? It hasn't happened yet. But what I would do is I would reinstall the OS and then restore all the data because I only back up data. I don't back up applications or anything like that. I just back up the data. So not, not, not the CFS made, uh, method data? No, okay. I don't back that up. So ba basically, this is a file level backup. It's not a, a file system level backup. Uh, what do you use to monitor Bacala to see that backups are running in storage and stuff like that? I have a Nagios job, a Nagios check that looks to see how old the catalog backup is. And since the catalog backup runs last, it would be held up by any other job that couldn't run. So I just check to make sure that that's not more than 36 hours old. And that happens a lot on Sundays. It, it passes that layer. Do you have any experiences with encrypted backups? Because I think Bacula is able to yeah. deal with them. I thought a lot about encrypted backups, just like I thought about encrypted file systems. But I figured that losing my encryption key was more dangerous than losing my data. So I'm, I meant someone else getting access to my data. That's what I meant by losing my data. I, I figure my threat model is not such that someone's going to steal my backups. And when I send them off-site, they're, they're not in the care of a third party. But if I was doing that, I would look at a, encryption. And you can figure the file daemon to do the encryption. So it's encrypted when it leaves the file daemon. And you can set it up so it cannot, it only has the public key. So you store the private key all, off, off the server and only put it in when you need to do the restore. I think the file daemon can deal with multiple pu public keys, but uh, I've not heard heard about anyone doing that. I've, I've seen discussions, but I've not done it. And the file daemon can compress, too, before it sends it over the wire. I think storage daemons can also compress, but I rely on ZFS compression to do that. Next. Backups are really boring. I'm surprised there's so many people here. I'm very impressed, though, that they all came in. C can you, can, you know, most of us can name software developers that write this or that. You can, most of you know the people that wrote Python or Perl, but nobody knows who wrote Bacula, right? Nobody? See? No, I, I wrote a small part. Kern Seibold wrote most of it, and he took over from someone before that. So you don't get famous writing backup software. <laughs> Unless it doesn't work, yeah. Um, it, I'm tempted to do all my backups with ZFS replication, yeah. um, which isn't supported at the moment in mm -hmm. Bacula. Is there any thoughts of adding it? I think the only problem would be that the catalog wouldn't know what files were yep. where. But yep. if, if you, if you uh, analyzed the snapshot 
mm -hmm. uh, that you did back up with ZFS mm -hmm. replication, you could add that to the catalog mm -hmm. for the list of files. So it, has there been any progress in adding that to Bacula? No, not at all, because Bacula is a, a file-based backup solution, not a file system based. But what I would do if you wanted to do that is I would back up your replicated data because that's read-only and I would back that up into Bacula so that then if your replication failed or something, you still have a copy in Bacula, which happens to be on another ZFS file system. But your beauty there is that <coughs> when you go to restore, you can say, I want a file from this date or I want all these files. I just, what really appealed to me when I was first looking at Bacula was the fact that it had a catalog and that Amanda at the time didn't. And, and I was this close to deploying Amanda. I had it all installed and stuff and someone said, look here. And the first thing I did was, was give them a Postgres backend because I didn't like MySQL as much. Other question? Yep. <laughs> To uh, regarding TLS and uh, multiple clients, uh, I experienced it, so it's possible. Uh, the fact is that uh, you don't use a PKI, a PKI because you just have public keys and private keys and no authority certification authorities that sign it, but the configuration is named PKI and the TLS configuration is configured to use uh, a PKI for authenticating everybody, but it's mm -hmm. uh, quite messy and uh, well, uh, I guess that if somewhere some people here had never used the Bacula, uh, the slide has maybe been a bit confusing, and it's true that it's a bit, big piece of, uh, of software. Uh, there is a fork project, Boreas. Uh, we won't talk uh, about that. Did you have experience uh, with this? Um, when, when the fork happened, it, it, it wasn't like, it wasn't a good situation. One of the things, some of the things that they did really annoyed the people that did the work on Bacula. They did, you know, not nice things like removing authors' names from files and changing the copyright headers and stuff like that. And so that created a lot of bad animosity between the groups. And the, I don't think there's a lot of difference between the two projects, but I prefer Bacula because that's where I started and bad blood. But yeah, B basically they're, they're about the same. They have some different features, but uh, I'm beginning to think that a lot of features are floating between the two. Any other questions? Oh, one more. How do you go about backing up databases and such like? Can you have sort of pre-exec hooks for doing a SQL dump or um, something? There is a feature called run before or run after, and it can run on the client or the server, uh, the, the server being Bacula Dur and the client being the Bacula FD. And so you can do whatever you want. And that's literally what I do, is in the run before job, I do a PG dump to disk. And then the examples that you see in the run after job, it deletes the file. I don't delete the file. I leave it there because it's another copy. But yeah, that, that, that's my preference is PG dump just because I, I like text files for backing up databases. I, I don't trust backing up the file system level, although many people claim that that's just fine if you do it right. I don't like it. Any more questions? Thank you, you're all very brave. Thank you. <laughs>